Let's talk battle tanks, artillery and luckless infantry holding the line against all horrors with an overview of the Imperial Guard in Warhammer 40k 10th edition. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics where today we're talking Astra Militarum and we're going to be doing a full overview of the Index in 10th edition with a look at their core rules and all the new data sheets. In recent times in 40k, Guard haven't been having too bad a time of it. They were kind of unlucky enough to have the last Codex revamp out of any of the Codexes out of 9th, only beating out World Eaters as a new faction out of the gate by about a month. Perhaps just a tiny bit frustrating to have their rules overwritten so soon, and quite a fun book too. Still seems like there's going to be plenty of interesting things happening in 10th though. We've got respawning infantry, very cheap artillery, and battle tanks with some scary sponsons and free gear rolled in. Lots of good stuff for the army. For Games Workshop's initial offering for the Guard in 10th edition, we have Index Astra Militarum. Their overall rule is Voice of Command, which is basically the renewed version of Orders. A little bit consolidated, and the same table for both tanks and infantry, but still seems very usable and powerful. They're going to be a bit more focused as individual unit buffs though, rather than ordering entire formations. The launch detachment is called the Combined Regiment. It seems to have some support aimed at both infantry tanks and artillery. And the detachment special rule is the reincarnation of Born Soldiers. Six is to hit auto wounds, but now it has to be when you're static, so it does encourage a bit more gun lining, as opposed to mobility across the board. The rest of the detachment has six stratagems and four enhancements, then we've got 59 datasheets. A few new ones have been gained due to them separating out the Lehman Ross datasheets, and the Forge World ones will follow in their own index in a little bit of time. It is pretty nice to finally have the points cost for the faction as well, so we can actually start to weigh up which units are looking good or bad relative to each other. Starting out then, let's talk about new orders. Voice of Command is basically the army rule for 10th edition. Just one table for both inventory and vehicles now. The Perfectors orders for the Commissars have gone. They just get their own datasheet abilities and can issue some of the orders on the table. And I would say that while the orders are really quite powerful, they're probably not quite as much so as in 9th. The orders are still declared in the command phase, so a bit unhelpful for things like reserves and transport vehicles besides the Chimera. It means that if you want to order things, generally your commanders need to be on the board and they can't be jumping out of transports like last time. And also the new Imperial Guard orders have lost their splash effect that they had in 10th edition, so you can't just have one order just fired the way of a whole formation and then say they all get to get take aim. It means the orders are going to be far more focused on really big heavy units as opposed to buying in an order literally for every small heavy weapons team or individual 10-man infantry squad. Usually the targets for these are either regiment or squadron keyworded things. Regiment for most of the infantry bar auxilia. Squadron for most of the vehicles besides things like plain super heavies and the tank commander himself. Most of the time the actual officer units do lack the keywords that they need to order them, but they can often lead units that can be ordered, so they can basically sort of self-order now provided they're ordering their lead squad. In 10th edition as well, Battleshock can also throw a spanner in the works as well, perhaps more so for guard than others. If a unit gets battle shocks, then it cancels the order's effects, and that could be a little bit unhelpful seeing as you cast the orders in the command phase, and then you roll for battle shock later. Could just mean that if you're trying to order a unit that's a bit depleted, it might have a chance of failing, basically. Could be kind of nasty for certain other debuffs as well, things like the Tyranid Shadow in the Warp could actually throw a spanner in the works. I think also useful to know is roughly how many orders can be spammed out by each unit. Lord Solar Leonta still seems to be god of orders basically. He can order any of your units at all, all the way up to super heavies and planes and things. Two orders can be done by Ursula Creed who can order two regiment things, as can Iron Hand Strachan and Gaunt's Ghosts. They can also self-order. And then you just get one order from each of the rest of these others. The tank commander one can affect the squadron units and that goes out to 12 inches. A few of the others have other restrictions like Sergeant Harker can only order Catachans and the Commissar can only choose two of the orders out of the list, Duty and Honour and Fixed Bayonet. Talking of which though, here's the six orders that we have to choose from. I'd say most of them are useful enough to both infantry and vehicles, but just due to the overlap it does mean that some are more so than others. I don't think that any of them are redundant, I think that they'll literally all get used, but I feel like perhaps particularly take aim for plus one to hit seems like it's going to be a staple. Making a slightly gunliney army a bit better at shooting is generally not the worst idea. Going through the list, move 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 gives you just plus three inches to your move characteristic now, not quite as big as it was before. Infantry squads will be moving nine inches with a normal move, or nine plus d6 with an advance. Lehman Rosses will be nipping around 13 inches, so not quite the fairly nippy threat range that they have at the moment with the advance order there. Still going to be really useful though, movement's important for objective, line of sight, or just staying hidden. Sometimes it's going to be the best choice. Fixed bayonets improves your weapon skill by plus one. 
a little bit on the niche side within the Imperial Guard, given that most things don't really have the most exciting combat stat line. Probably most useful on the Rough Riders, could be interesting enough on Borgrin maybe as well, if Lord Solar decides to order them to do that. Take aim, as I said, I think is going to be the staple. It's a plus one to your unit's ballistic skill, so nice solid extra firepower there. Quite nice that it modifies the ballistic skill as well, not just the hit roll, as that means they it can also stack with other positive two hit modifiers. Perhaps in particular the heavy weapon keyword means that certain guard units can be hitting on twos. First rank fire, second rank fire is basically a flatly superior version of take aim pretty much if you apply it to infantry units, or at least ones that have a decent amount of rapid fire. This one improves the attack's characteristic of rapid fire weapons by 1. So things like blast guns would fire 2 shots at 24 inches or 3 shots at to 12. And kind of interestingly, it does actually work with plasma guns now. Seems like that could be very interesting in infantry squads there. Take cover I think is very good as well. This one's the durability one. Improve the save characteristic of models by 1. Though this can't improve saves better than a 3 plus. So it's essentially worthless on vehicles pretty much. This one really is pretty excellent. And again, it improves the save characteristic. So potentially can stack with other things like cover, as that one adds one to the saving throw once more. So again, you could have a unit in theory on a 2 plus save with this. Make, say, a Kazakhin unit a 3 plus on their base characteristic and then plus one in cover. Interestingly enough as well, take cover appears to work in combat as well, not just at range. So pretty nice for trying to repel enemy combat as well, not just resist their shooting when you're on objectives. Seems really nice on a big massed up 20 man block holding a point. Finally we've got duty and honour which allows you to improve the leadership and objective control characteristic of models in the unit by one. Normally that's going to be leadership 6 guardsmen and the objective control thing is going to be most meaningful on bigger squads. Say Kazakin with two objective control each or regular guardsmen with three. Pretty much meaning that your opponent is going to have to wipe out a whole load of the unit if they want to take the point. Perhaps the most interesting thing with this one I think is that it happens in the command phase. So it means that you could directly see whether or not casting this will actually make the difference between you scoring an objective at the end of the command phase or not. I guess if you just absolutely don't want to fail Battleshock on a unit as well, then buffing the leadership just before you take the test seems reasonable. I guess still probably one of the most niche ones unless you think that both you and your opponent will have models on the point at the end of the turn. Overall though, seems like a solid table, a little bit less overawing than before, but still some very solid and flexible picks. Move, 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 take aim and take cover will be my staple ones, with the other three being situationally very good. Next up we've got the Combined Regiment. This one's the launch detachment for the Astra Militarum in 10th edition, and this is the one that gives you Born Soldiers and a bunch of stratagems, including a rather nice reinforcement one. Born Soldiers very much keeps the spirit of the rule that we've had through most of 9th edition. It's still shooting attacks get auto wounds on 6s, now lethal hits in 10th, but it has been toned down really quite a lot in 10th edition I think. You have to be static to be able to access the buff, so you can't move around and still get these shooting benefits. It is the entire army, there's no exclusion for things like Auxilia or anything like that, it's just literally everything that's Astra Militarum. Though I do think it's going to be a lot more relevant for certain units more so than others. I would bear in mind as well that with the way it's worded, it is now just during your own turn now, not during your opponent's. It's if it remains stationary then until the end of the turn, ranged weapons gain lethal hits, so that wouldn't be applying in your opponent's turn, which is pretty notable for Overwatch. Has made guard Overwatch just a little bit less effective there. Though it's definitely declined in scope, lethal hits is still a really powerful ability, particularly for any sort of low strength volume fire. It means that weapons like las guns, heavy bolters and mortars and things can definitely punch up a bit against heavier targets in the opponent's army, things that they usually wouldn't really hope to hurt. Perhaps particularly relevant in the era of very high toughness vehicles and things, night armies are going to be a pain to slog through. Quite nice to have the, at least the option of your small arms contributing to the firepower as well as your heavy guns. Still though, I think it has got a lot worse. Movement's really important in 40k, you're going to need to move to get to objectives, get line of sight on your targets, not just sit out in the open so you might want to hide behind cover and then pop out to shoot your opponents, or just moving forward to getting cover yourself and get its benefits. Realistically this one's going to mean that just about every guard unit is going to have to weigh up whether they want a little bit of an increase in firepower or if they want to be moving this turn. I feel like it's definitely going to skew guard lists a little bit more towards gun lining and perhaps particularly artillery than they would do otherwise without this, as it is quite a decent rule. Generally the rule's going to be a lot more powerful if you're wounding on a 4+, plus, 5+, plus or worse. It's perhaps a lot more worth bearing in mind if your unit's going to, as you'll actually get more of a meaningful damage buff. It does mean that you could potentially play your same guard army very differently depending on the army that you're fighting. Maybe try and deploy your army so you're trying to stay static a fair bit against knights and things where the punching up really matters. But if you were playing a lot of toughness 3 enemies that you were going to wound pretty easily anyway, 
it's just not quite as important and you might want to embrace a bit more movement. It does seem though that the units that care the least about this will be things like artillery and long range gun line units. Artillery broadly doesn't either need or particularly want to move anyway, plus it often gets the heavy keyword if it stays still. So born soldier seems particularly helpful for our artillery lists. Moving into stratagems and the combined regiment brings six of them. Armored might is two command points for a minus one damage debuff for shooting against the guard vehicle. Can be anything from a Ross to a Sentinel. The minus one damage is perhaps particularly good against any damage two or damage three shooting. As per that core rules update commentary, it no longer reduces damage one weapons down to damage zero. It's not going to be particularly effective against las cannons where it's only basically a 28% durability buff. They've just got too much damage for this to be particularly meaningful. In reality though, this is probably going to be secondary to the smoke stratagem from the core book on quite a lot of vehicles quite a lot of the time. Smoke's just one CP, so half the cost of this, and gives you minus one to hit with stealth and also the benefit of cover. If you get both of those when you didn't have either before, that's often a 60-80% to durability buff, so it seems to far outweigh this against shooting for the one CP versus two. This one might be okay though if you're getting a free stratagem, as Creed can get you. Next up, we've got Expert Bombardiers. It does seem that the regiment seems to want to favour both artillery, infantry and tanks. This one's a buff to artillery with a Voxcaster basically marking any targets. Use a Voxcaster unit to target one enemy unit and then any of your indirect fire units making an attack against that enemy unit get plus one to their hit roll. Seems a bit of an alternative to things like Scout Sentinels maybe. They also give a similar sort of boost and they do it for free. I would say that probably the more efficient way is to just buy a bunch of Scout Sentinels and have them do that for you. This one does seem nice enough in a pinch though, provided you've got a fair bit of barrage fire. A plus one to hit for multiple units from one CP is efficient. Next up for one command points as well, we've got suppression fire. This one's an infantry one that targets an enemy unit that isn't a monster or vehicle. If your infantry unit scores one or more hit rolls against that enemy unit, then the enemy is debuffed with a minus one to hit until the end of your opponent's next turn. Kind of handy enough, it works both in range and melee. I feel like this one is one to go for if your opponent just has a massively scary unit that you can't do anything about this turn. Say a great big Terminator Death Star or something like that, making them hit on one worse is probably going to be worth it in terms of models that you save. Kind of a shame it can't apply to great big super heavies like enemy big hitters or knights or things, but occasionally I think that this will be efficient enough to use. Next up, Inspired Command allows you to issue an order in your opponent's command phase. This one's maybe a little bit niche, it only will affect one unit as well, so you're not splashing it to a whole formation. And because most of the orders are sort of damage focused or movement focused, there's only really two that are relevant for this. Those two are take cover for plus one to your saving throws, which is very relevant in your opponent's turn, or plus one objective control. And again, that could be used for some big shenanigans. If your opponent has just enough models to hold a point, this one could allow you to take that point off them if you hadn't already issued that. For the take cover one as well, it could be interesting to have your units basically get a plus one to hit in the opponent's turn perhaps, give them a big damage boost, and then you can also have your cake and eat it as when it gets to the opponent's turn, you get to have the plus one save. So if maybe for a big 20 man infantry unit, you get to both have boosted damage and defense. Next up, another pricey two command point one in fields of fire. Again, this one's another interesting focus shooting buff, this time applying to regiment and squadron units, and you get to hand it out to one enemy unit that's been targeted by some attacks by a different regiment and squadron unit. It is really quite easy to hand out the debuff, you don't even need to hit with the attacks, just basically declare them as a target. After that first unit is shot, then you get basically AP-1 for all the other regiment and squadron units that target that enemy. So potential for things like AP-1 las guns, AP-4 las cannons, or AP-2 heavy bolters there. Again, a little bit of a pricey one, but if you were targeting one armoured enemy with a 2 plus save with a large part of your gun line, probably going to be pretty efficient between all that. And it is kind of interesting that it stacks pretty well with the exterminator, Lehman Ross buff, potentially a fairly brutal AP-2 better against that one marked target there. Finally, I've definitely saved the best till last with the stratagems. Reinforcements is 2 command points, and basically gives you a whole bunch of respawning guardsmen. Again, a big pricey two command points one, and that's quite a lot in 10th edition as you start on zero. But this one really is quite powerful. When you have a regiment unit that's destroyed, you get to use the stratagem, and then you basically put it back into strategic reserve as a starting strength with all wounds remaining. Though you do lose any characters or attached units, so only the base squad comes back. You don't get to respawn Castellans or anything. Two command points could be working on somewhere around 130 or 150 points of models, I guess the Armoured Sentinels are the absolute maximum of this, going all the way up to 210. The regiment keywords are basically all the infantry plus the Sentinels. It includes things like the base infantry squads, Tempestus Scions, 
Hazakin, Field Ordnance, Heavy Weapon Squads, so really quite a lot of options there. Even with the requirement to turn up as strategic reserves, I still think that this is very, very good. Two command points for like another 150 points worth of fairly tough guardsmen or sentinels is absolutely great. I feel like this one is going to trump a whole load of other stratagems in the guard army for quite a lot of the game. Could certainly be used to maybe bait your opponent's damage into one target, maybe have the sentinels play very aggressively and force your opponent to deal with them, only to respawn when they get shot down. And you could even be doing a bit of counterplay with it. Say if your opponent had a bunch of vehicles and they wanted to get rid of your heavy LAS cannon field ordnance batteries, you could just use this for 2 CP to respawn them. Overall, a very spooky stratagem. It will definitely make it feel like guard are an endless wave of bodies trying to crush the enemy. I feel like this is going to be one of the most commonly used stratagems for the Imperial Guard in 10th. Overall, in general, I feel like the guard stratagems are kind of okay, but maybe not the most exciting besides the reinforcements one. Pretty much all the rest of them either just feel like they're kind of situational or just done better by other things that have the raw on their raw data sheets. I have a feeling that there's going to be a fair few armies that are just going to be spamming out the stratagems on reinforcements and perhaps some of the core things like tank shock for mortal wounds or overwatch with some particularly big nasty tanks like Rogal Dawns. Next up we've got enhancements and the guard index has four of them. The death mask of Alanius is 10 points. Previously this was a personal durability buff with an invulnerable save. Now it's basically a bit of an insurance against objective control dropping, only subtracting 1 rather than going to 0. So at least on squads like Cadian Shock Troops and Death Corps of Krieg and things, you'll have objective control 1. So it seems like 1 to have maybe on an aggressive infantry squad moving forward. I think for 10 points it's definitely usable. It is going to be just a little bit on the niche side though. You need that squad to be shot down to below half health and then fail your leadership test before it even applies. And also to be relevant, you'd either have to get the objective control to flip it versus your opponent, or just be there on their own and have no other of your units on the objective. Every so often might turn itself into a few victory points, not super reliably though, and it just seems a little bit on the niche side. Drill Commander is 20 points. This one allows your stationary units to get critical hits on a 5 instead of a 6 but only if the squad managed to remain stationary in the movement phase, so it's basically doubling down on your born soldiers. It has to apply to the unit that they're actually leading, so it has to be one of the squads that the characters can attach to. Generally speaking, that'll tend to be Kazakhin, Scions and Infantry units. You can't attach characters directly to things like Field Ordnance Batteries. I guess it could give a big ranked up infantry squad a surprising punch against heavier targets. I feel like having a turn though where your infantry squad can just stay completely still and your opponent has just obligingly walked their army right into range is maybe a bit on the rare side. I guess if you've got lots of other pressing threats though, they might not have the most choice. Could perhaps make a 20 block of guardsmen into a surprisingly punchy counterfire unit. Next up, and for some reason just 15 points, is Grand Strategist, which seems just absolutely auto-include for that. In the command phase, your commander can issue one additional order. I feel like you're going to have room for that somewhere in your army, it's just more of a case of where. Could be very nice on, say, a company commander just sat back with some heavy weapon teams, giving them plus one to hit for some mortars, perhaps. And I think it could also be very useful on a tank commander, as they still issue just the one order to one tank. Having this on a tank commander just for 15 points could mean that you could have two other friendly Lehman Rosses getting a plus one to hit, rather than just one. I'd say this one's probably the best out of them in terms of raw value for the points. I would expect to see this in most guard lists, probably. Finally, for 40 points, we have Kirov's Aquila, which is definitely an interesting one, but does cost a lot. Could be very disruptive to your opponent, though. Once per game, after your opponent has used a stratagem, the bearer can use this enhancement. If it does, then until the end of the battle, the command point cost of that stratagem gets increased by one. Perhaps one of the spookiest things that you could do with this is use it on the command point reroll. Just putting that kind of out of reach in terms of efficiency would be pretty brutal. Things like reroll charges can be absolutely critical. Could be really nice on Overwatch as well, or on just about any other stratagem that's absolutely critical for the faction. I'm sure other guard players wouldn't enjoy that being used on their reinforcement stratagem, for example. Still though, 40 points really is quite a lot for that ability. If it was much cheaper, I think it would be kind of auto-include. When you get into that much though, it's looking a fair bit more take or leave. If you are thinking about taking this as well, you might consider taking the Kaladus Assassin. She's 115 points, I believe, and has the same ability, so it would give you the option to basically think about buying one of those for the extra 75 points, if that made sense. Overall, out of the enhancements, Grand Strategist seems auto-include. I think the others all seem fine, but kind of reflect their points cost. Maybe not particularly exciting compared with just getting more units. I suppose with 10th edition fixed unit sizes, might not be the worst to fill up the last few points, though. Overall, the combined regiment does look like a fairly solid launch detachment, I think. Probably the best things about it seem to be born soldiers for artillery, a pretty direct damage increase there. Grand strategies for the extra order, 
and respawning infantry and sentinels with reinforcements, I feel like all those three will be seen in quite a few games. Into the big meat of the index next, and next up we have the data sheets for the new units. In the guard index, we've got battle line units in the infantry squad, the Cadians, Cathchans, and Death Corps of Krieg. All of those are still basically different variants on the same infantry squad units, and interestingly can be fielded between 10 and 20. So if you did want to spam them and go very infantry heavy, you could be taking 120 of each flavour of them, obviously up to your points cap. As well as that, Scions can also be battle line as well if you take the Tempesta Prime as your warlord. Not the hardest to unlock there should you want to, so you could have a fair few Scion squads dropping around and lighting up the enemy with special weapons. In the various indexes, there's been quite a few data sheets that have been lost in one place or another. For the Astra Militarum, though, it doesn't look like there's been any major casualties compared with last time. The Codex wasn't out all that long ago, I suppose, and they did have a bit of a cold then, with iconic choices like veteran special weapon squads, Yarrick and Pask all going. Kind of a bit sad that they've not come back. A fair few of the other armies have had a bunch of their range rotated miniatures still included in these indexes, but I guess they've been removed already. Otherwise, though, as best I can tell, all the other codex choices seem to have stayed, and in fact, the Guard have actually gained a few data sheets because they've decided to separate out the Lehman Rosses. Akin to the Bane Blades now, we have a crazy eight different data sheets for different flavours of tank, all the different top guns plus the tank commander. Seems a bit overkill, but at the same time I think it's just due to having a different datasheet rule for each one of them, and also in 10th edition they'd all have to be priced the same otherwise, so perhaps it might be for the best that they all have their own individual points costs. I think having different datasheet rules does make having a mix of them a bit more interesting, though it seems they've still managed to make the Lumen Rush Eradicator utterly rubbish. Otherwise a fair few profiles have stayed at least somewhat similar, most vehicles have got a toughness boost, and a few have even got a save boost to a 2+. Guard leadership is 7 plus pretty much across the board, and that includes certain leaders like Cadian Castellans and really big things like Baneblades. They're definitely going to be an army that will feel Battleshock more than most. I feel like the infantry unit change is quite a big thing as well for the dynamic. Infantry squads being in 10 or 20 to get around the whole battle line restriction. Going to be interesting to see some combined squads on the board with two sergeants. Before we get into the data sheets proper, here's the armoury both for the infantry and then the vehicles. Just a few common choices consolidated, so Games Workshop didn't have to print them on literally every single data sheet, and there are a fair few common changes with other things in Warhammer 40k here. I think the auto cannon's quite an interesting profile, two shots at strength 9, AP 1 and damage 3. I think that's a lot more tempting than it was back in 9th edition, and that's maybe kind of helpful for the guard as they have quite a few auto cannons on offer. Otherwise, heavy flamers ignore cover. Last cannons are still basically the best anti-heavy tank with strength 12 and damage d6 plus 1. Missile launchers picked up an extra pip of strength. Mortars remain strength 5 and haven't dropped back down to strength 4 or anything. Plus the new 10th edition blast keyword will help them out a bit more. And generally plasma weapons across the board got AP-2 on their worst profile, but AP-3 and damage 2 if you overcharge. Otherwise for the vehicles we've got the new profiles for the Lehman Ross turrets here. I think they're literally just reprinted here because they wouldn't have enough space on the tank commander data sheets, and we will go through these in a bit more detail later. For a quick run through though, the Dommage Battle Cannon is looking the scariest, strength 14 and damage d6, Eradicators gain strength, the Execution of Plasma Cannon is pretty much the same, but its new strength isn't quite as exciting in 10th edition, the Exterminators gain some twin links and a bit more strength than the new Auto Cannon profile, the Punisher lost AP, and the Vanquisher no longer ignores invulnerable saves, it did pick up the heavy keyword though, so it's a bit more accurate than the rest. We'll cycle back to the tanks later. First up, let's talk through the other units of the Codex. We'll start out with infantry and the Rough Rider Cavalry, then do more static heavy weapons, then talk through auxiliar, vehicles, and then the Militarum Tempestus units. First up, and the backbone of the guard, we have the infantry squad. Now, as mentioned, basically either a 10-man squad or a 20-man squad, though technically it's 9 to 20 due to the option of taking heavy weapons, which replace two guardsmen. These are 65 points for the base 10, or 130 for the full 20. In that, it seems that you get two sergeant models, two heavy weapons, and two special weapons, broadly with similar stats to how they had before, barring the changes to their war gear. Kind of interesting to be able to field them in such big units. I guess they'll be quite efficient for things like that reinforcement stratagem or focal orders. In big units, though, they will get taken apart by blast weapons a lot easier. Otherwise, for weapon changes, the sniper rifles got AP-2 and damage 2 now, it has lost mortal wounds, and the new guard grenade launcher profile is looking rather fun as well. The frag mode I still think is kind of poor, D3 shots at strength 4, AP0, damage 1. The crack mode is really quite cool though, strength 9, AP-2 and damage D3, genuinely somewhat threatening to light vehicles like rhinos now. 
I feel like plasma guns could be pretty interesting as well though, particularly with the new version of first rank fire, second rank fire. Now all the war gear is free as well, I guess things like power sword and plasma pistol sergeants are probably the way to go, giving them a little bit more punch against the toughest stuff that the enemy has. Vox casters here allow you potentially to get a cheaper stratagem if you still have one on the board. If you target the unit with a stratagem then on a 5 plus you gain one command point, so all nice and helpful there. And now the infantry units have got it maybe a little bit more to differentiate them with their unique special rules. Even the standard infantry squad gets something interesting called Defenders of Humanity. This one gives them the benefit of cover when they're within range of an objective marker now, something that's absolutely excellent if you want to hold a point out in the open. Means that if you have this and also have that go to ground order, you've got guardsmen saving on a 3 plus against enemy fire. That does seem really quite annoying on paper to take down, and they can certainly chip in a bit of firepower while they do. Finally, I think it's kind of interesting that the infantry squad variants can have two different leader models attached to it, though you can't double up on command squad units means that you could have, say, a Castellan plus a Commissar perhaps, and you could be getting really quite a hoardy unit on the go with 20 models plus another 5 for the command squad, never mind another leader. Quite a lot of bodies on objectives there, and more hoardy than most armies can field. Then besides them, we've got the three other different variants of the standard infantry squad, each of them based on the different kit that Games Workshop sells. Still feels a little bit arbitrary, and I'd probably just say that I'm using the datasheet for them rather than having a mishmash of four different regiments in the army, unless you really are going for combined arms, all sorts of guardsmen type thing. The Cajun shock troops, as with last time, swap out their heavy weapon for a second special weapon, not the worst on a squad that's moving forward quickly. As before, you can't double them up within a 10-man squad, so, but you could still have, say, two plasma guns and two melter guns in a 20-man. As well as that, they've got a few less options on the sergeant, but can take a drum-fed auto gun with two shots out to 24 inches. And their special rule is called Shock Troops. You no longer get the re-rolls with LAS weapons. Instead, they grant you that sticky objectives type rule. The one where you still hold it, even if you move off it, unless your opponent can control it at some point. I feel that like perhaps most relevant for denying battle shock, I suppose, though it could be handy if you need to hold the point and move on. They're the same cost as all the rest of the infantry variants. I feel like that rule is interesting, but perhaps doesn't feel quite as massively stand out as it was before. Next up, we've got the Death Corps of Krieg, who I think are looking a lot better in the new rules here. Not that they were particularly bad before. They're now the same cost as the others, and I feel like that's quite a nice position to be in, given that you can still take three special weapons per 10-man unit of them. Six specials in a big 20, so a bit more dangerous than some of them, maybe. Particularly with Plasma Melter and Grenade Launcher for three big shots. I think their special rules also a particularly nice one as well. They get a plus one to hit if the squad's damaged but not destroyed, and then a plus one to wound as well if the squad's depleted below half health. Particularly with bigger 20-man squads, I feel like that's actually going to trigger sometime, and it's really quite a meaningful increase in their damage there. Otherwise though, the new rule for their meta pack looks quite nice as well. Basically in each of your command phase, just automatically gets to regenerate D3 destroyed death core from the unit. But it does seem that Games Workshop might have messed up this data sheet just a little bit, as they hadn't actually given any rules for any numbers of death core models getting the meta pack. And I feel like even if they did, maybe the rule isn't entirely clear whether or not it applies once or twice if you happen to have two medics in the unit. I guess it'd probably mean that you'd be able to regenerate two D3, but it might be quite nice to have that spelled out. Overall, at the moment, rules as written maybe not working properly. Could do with an FAQ, but I feel like they might honestly be one of the best of the infantry data sheets given these changes. The respawning guardsman is very nice indeed, three special weapons is nice, and the damage buff is really quite a meaningful one when it triggers. Finally, we have the Katachan jungle fighters, who certainly got passed over a bit last edition, but it seems that Games Workshop might have actually chosen to give them a niche now. Again, either 10 or 20 models for the same cost as the rest, Thankfully, they don't weirdly cost more than the Cadians now, and still maybe one of their more unfortunate things is their locks to just taking flamers and nothing but. Certainly not useless, and could be quite nice with 10th edition Overwatch, but does maybe specialise them into being fairly anti-infantry. I think the most exciting thing about their datasheet, though, is that the Castachan ones appear to have gained scouts 6 inches. Really quite a solid rule, I think. Means that they can be getting towards the midfield objectives right from the early game, and give you a first wave of infantry for the opponents to deal with, and hopefully screen out them from dealing with the next ones. Having a whole bunch of objective control 2 models in the midfield right from the start of the game seems like a pretty solid idea, and you might even be able to move them into cover or out of line of sight there to give your opponent a few more problems dealing with them. Otherwise, they do actually have a meaningful boost to their melee as well. They get plus 1 strength and their extra AP in the first round of combat when they're either charged or made a charge. They do still hit on 4s there, so I'm not sure it's entirely massively exciting still. If you are getting 20 attacks out of them though, and can get all of them in fighting range in a big 20-man unit, 
You could actually take a surprising chunk out of at least a few enemies, perhaps particularly if you decide to include Iron Hand Strachan into the unit, as his combat profile is genuinely scary. Still though, not unhelpful, and will actually bully some enemy light infantry a bit. Some light Eldar elites or something might be surprised by the last few of these guardsmen hitting back a bit harder than expected. Overall, I think they look really quite usable with a scout profile. Probably not going too mad on them, just one or two units to move into the midfield early, and be the first wave of bodies on midfield objectives to hold those points. Otherwise, for the non-battle line guardsmen squads, we've got the Kazakin, the only other guard infantry unit now that isn't either a big gun, an auxiliar choice, or a Tempestus Scion. These guys still come in their rigid squads of 10 as they did before, 120 points now, so a little bit more expensive, and you still get those four special weapons per unit of 10, no more than two of each. In general, their stat line's pretty similar, though their hot shots have disappointingly dropped to AP-1 now, down from AP-2. This will definitely give the standard rank and file a lot less bite against heavy hitters that they're punching up against. Looks like after the unit, the focus is going to be a lot more on the special weapons as opposed to the hot shots now. Otherwise, for unit upgrades though, the hotshot sniper is still damage 3, so it's a fairly scary precision shot there. The volley gun has also lost a bit of AP now, and they've basically got the same stat line otherwise. Rapid fire 2, strength 4, AP minus 1. I feel like the melter mine's probably worth the include, costing you a las gun. This one's deployed at the start of any phase, either when you get very close to the enemy, or when they try and charge you or something, and just gives you a 2 plus chance to deal D3 mortal wounds, or a big 2D3 if it happens to be able to hit a vehicle. I think that kind of threat is probably worth the new last gun profile, and you still do get a hotshot pistol to shoot with I suppose. Otherwise, they've also picked up scouts, that could be kind of nice with something like a Chimera or a Torox perhaps, get that up the board a bit earlier, and then move forward and drop them off for some first turn shooting action or counter striking the enemy. And their special rule is they basically get a bonus order for them every turn, you get to just choose one of the six buffs in addition to any orders you might have issued them. I feel like that could be very nice indeed on the offensive, getting both rapid fire with your plasma guns and hot shots, and also plus one to hit, who I suppose if needed could make them harder to kill as well with a plus one to your saves, and then either combine that with one of the damage buffs or even just a more objective control. Sort of annoying, it doesn't really work with the transports though, I don't believe that you'd be able to access that rule or orders if you were embarked in the command phase. Overall, I still think that they seem interesting, maybe not quite as much the obvious rock stars of the codex though, now they're competing against 20 man infantry units to buff, and they cost a few more points. Next up, we've got the cavalry of the Attilan Rough Riders, 5 to 10 models in the unit, and either 80 or 160 points. They have come down in points a fair bit, down to 16 per model rather than 20. It's definitely a bit less at glass cannons there, though their damage output has dropped as well. The unit shifted a bit to be a bit more anti-infantry focused. The lances are definitely less threatening with only one attack now on the big profile or d6 with the frag tip lance. The melter profile is still scary with a hitting on a 3 plus, strength 9, AP minus 4 and damage d6. Very nasty against space marines and things and the frag tip strength 4 AP 0 damage 1 with d6 attacks. They both have the lance keyword for a plus 1 to wound and the riders have also picked up some horse attacks as well from the steeds hooves with the extra attacks. Two extra ones at strength 4 AP 0 and damage 1. Just a bit more skews to killing light infantry. Otherwise broadly similar beyond that. They ignore movement modifiers, they can still shoot with some las guns and they can fall back shoot and charge so they're hard to pin down. I suppose it might be kind of helpful that cavalry models can actually gain the benefit of cover in this edition. That might help their survivability at least a little bit. I still think they're going to be interesting as one of the only melee units that guard can field, but we're not going to be at the point where just five of them are sweeping an Imperial Knight in a single turn now, as you could have done before with Lord Solar rerolls plus an order. Next up, let's talk about the gun emplacements with the heavy weapon squad and the field ordnance batteries. First up, we've got the heavy weapons teams, who are very slightly increased in cost at 60 points per unit. Three teams again, and still basically just two wounds worth of guardsman profile, so ridiculously fragile to take down. As per normal, this will make the direct fire weapons quite a lot more risky. Though admittedly, the new last cannon profiles are very nice. Three shots at strength 12, AP 3 and damage D6 plus 1 isn't at all bad for 60 points, provided your opponent doesn't have long range weapons to just shoot them dead instantly. Otherwise, the new auto cannon profile is a bit better, and I feel like mortars might still well be one of the best choices for them. They quite like born soldiers and the new blast rule, but they won't get the minus one AP as they did before with take aim. They'd have to rely on something else for it, like a sentinel marking the target perhaps. Otherwise, their last weapon profile has been changed to last small arms, which is a single pistol shot. Small change there. And their special rule is that they're allowed to overwatch on a 5 plus or a 4 plus if the unit's right next to a platoon unit. I suppose if you wanted it, that could be one way of getting another round of firing out of a last cannon unit before it dies. It would cost you a precious command point though, unless you're using Creed's buff for it. 
I do have a feeling that these might be a bit more niche though, still incredibly fragile, and they're a small unit with less efficient orders that don't splash to other units. I can't help but think that the other artillery options and the field ordnance batteries might be looking a little bit better by comparison. Speaking of which, I do think that the field ordnance guns are looking rather nice indeed. They're 100 points now, rather than 130, so it came down really quite a lot. I've got a whole bunch of helpful keywords and got a bit tougher. They're regiments so you can be ordered and recycle them with reinforcements if desired. They've got the artillery keyword which can help them be buffed by a master of ordnance if you have one of those. And they do actually have the infantry keyword now which will help them out get a little bit of a better save in terrain and cover. Generally all good things, plus they've also gained toughness 5 as well so are a fair bit more resilient to small arms as they still have those 6 wounds. Generally speaking it just feels like there's a lot to like about these guys. Pretty much similar sort of firepower outputs to the heavy weapons team, but far harder to kill. Their guns have perhaps taken some slight side grades, but no too radical changes. The Bombast losing a bit of AP, but gaining the new blast. Heavy last cannon still pretty scary, with damage D6 plus 1 and strength 14, so they are pretty threatening to heavy armour. The rockets are kind of similar, which maybe isn't the best for them, seeing as they were a bit more underwhelming, I thought. They do want to stay still, otherwise they'll go down to hitting on a 5. Their special rule is that they get even better with orders. If you order the units, then they get sustained hits one as well as the rest. Definitely a solidly nice boost, and he certainly wants to be getting sixes if possible, as that'll be one lethal hit and one sustained hit normally. They don't stack, but that's all going to be extra damage against your target. Overall, I feel like these guys look fairly solid. They will have plenty of competition for other guard firepower though, perhaps particularly the new cheaper artillery platforms. Auxilia next, and first up we have the Ogryn squad. 3-6 models at either 75 or 150 points, slightly cheaper points per model than before, and they haven't really lost the most either, they've gained toughness 6, they do trade the minus 1 damage out for a feel no pain type save, which has its positives and negatives. The Ripper guns I'd say have been amped up in power but are maybe a bit harder to deliver, they lost 1 pip of AP but now they've gained rapid fire 3 as well, so they basically get double shots within 9 inches if you can get them that close. I guess perhaps one of the best ways seems to be to put three of them in a Torox, or I guess you could have a big squad of six in a great big super heavy transport, but annoyingly squads of four of them in a Chimera just wouldn't be that efficient due to the points cost changes. Their special rule gives you an extra pip of AP if you happen to be shooting against your closest target, might not happen literally all the time, they might not want to target a great big vehicle if there's a tasty infantry target nearby, but I guess the times that you do, you will still get that AP minus two, it certainly looks pretty massively brutal if you're within the 9 inches there. Seems weird to think that Ogryn could actually be a kind of interesting guard unit now. 18 shots within 9 inch range at strength 5, AP 2 and damage 2 for just 75 points seems pretty nice. But I feel like their profile still not quite as tanky as you might expect for Ogryn, at least for the points cost. Next up we've got Bulgrin, 3 or 6 models in the squad for 90 or 180 points. They'll now be 5 points more expensive than the Ogryn per model and they look like the ones to go for if you do want really tough brutes, as they keep the feel no pain, they get the unbronable saves from their brute shields, and they also do retain the minus one damage as well, so compared with the Ogryn, all sorts of barriers to damage there, and then you can either blaze away with some grenadier gauntlets, or the Bulgrin Morse for strength seven and damage two melee. Out of the two, now they cost completely the same still, I still prefer the Bulgrim Morse, the Grenadier Gauntlets just aren't really much good for anything besides killing light infantry, and you generally want them to be a bit more general purpose I think. These guys have taken one big nerf though, and that's to the slab shield. That one previously gave them a 2 plus save, and now like a fair few other shields in the game, it's changed to giving them more wounds. The slab shield ones get 4 wounds and just the 4 plus regular save. The brute shield ones get the 3 wounds, but the 4 plus invulnerable save. It's going to be pretty weird not having Borgrim running around on a 2 plus armour. That's been the case for quite a while now. I'd say that now puts the brute shield decently ahead of the slab shield though. Maybe just have perhaps one slab shield in the units to tank a weird damage 3 hit or something on it, or to be tanking AP0 shots where it doesn't matter between the brute shield or the invul. Overall, perhaps not the most awesome changes for these guys. Again, though, they do cover a melee niche in the guard army. Might not be too bad as just a durable combat capable unit to have in the battle line. I think even with the loss of the 2 plus armor save, they are still very sturdy. The invulnerable saves are good and they get that 6 plus feel no pain on top of the minus 1 damage and the toughness 6 now. Rattlings are now just a single unit for 70 points. They infiltrate, so start in the midfield. Seems that if you want guard infiltration, then it's going to be these guys doing the job now. They're more gaunt ghosts. The scout sentinels no longer start forward, they just have scout. You are paying quite a significantly increased privilege for that though. Previously they were 50 points, now they're 70. And I feel like they haven't really gained all that much in terms of onboard power. 
The sniper rifle is perhaps a little bit more dangerous. Strength 4, AP 2 and damage 2 definitely looks better on paper, but actually lacking the mortal wounds on 6s is quite a big deal. They were quite a good way of dealing just a little bit of reliable damage. Still could certainly potentially surprise a space marine or a lighter character with a lucky volley of shots. Otherwise they've got stealth for minus 1 to hit, plus they've also got their move shoot move rule so they can pop in and out of cover. With toughness 2 they just can't really afford to be taking just about any fire whatsoever. They need to hide on an objective ideally, ping out, take some shots, and then move back. I feel like they're a bit on the expensive side though for toughness 2 miniatures. Vehicles next, and we'll start with the mainline battle tanks with the trusty Lehman Russ. As mentioned, these things have been separated out into now 8 different data sheets, including the tank commander, one for each of the Russ turrets. Most of the data sheets are pretty much the same, it's literally just the turret profile that's changed and also their special rule as well. Games Workshop may be trying to give each of them a bit more of a niche role within the range, really quite a good idea. The data sheets vary between 180 and 220 points. The standard Lehman Russ battle tank is sort of a mid point one, 195. I did notice as well though that any form of squadrons for this have been dropped. If you get one Lehman Russ battle tank, then you literally just get this one model. You can't fill three in the same unit. It means that if you absolutely want to spam loads of Russes, then you would need to take at least a small variation in turrets. You could have three battle cannons, three demolisher cannons, and three plasma cannons if you wanted. The points cost is also significantly more expensive than we're used to seeing for the guard tanks. Previously, perhaps a stock one with heavy bolter sponsons would have cost you 165, so that's 30 points extra. In that cost though, you do get a heavy stubber, a hunter killer missile, and fancy sponsons included if you wanted. You can fill them with multi melters and plasma cannons now and it won't cost you any more due to 10th edition points. It does mean that fielding a Ross without sponsons is generally a bit of a bad idea now. Kind of a shame really, as it was quite nice to have the customization. but 10th edition points and free war gear have kind of put pay to that. Durability wise, their toughness 11, a 2 plus save, and 13 wounds, still very solid. Last cannons will take them apart pretty quickly, wounding them on 3s, but should be pretty durable against most other anti-tank that's less strength than that. They do degrade a bit less painfully, only losing a minus one to hit at four wounds or less. That will be less nasty than before. And they do have the smoke keyword as well, which will certainly help them with durability. A minus one to hit and cover is great. Covering the more generic things for the Rust to start with, the sponsons are free, so I'd guess probably things like the melters and the plasma might be some of the most interesting. The plasmas are pretty brutal, particularly with the new blast, and the melters are absolutely deadly at close range. I feel like the sheer amount of threat that they have probably puts them ahead of the flamers, though I could still see heavy flamers being decent enough for an aggressive Rust. I'd guess that the heavy bolters are probably going to be somewhat outcompeted, though they have picked up sustained hits, so maybe not quite as much as they would have been if they hadn't made that change. Otherwise, nice to have a hunter killer missile shot with that scary strength 14 and AP minus 3 profile. On the top gun, you'd want a heavy stubber, as for some reason they've decided to make it just a flat superior version of the Storm Bolter now. Three shots out to 36 inches and rapid fire 3, so it gets significantly better within 18 inches. On the top gun, the turret has lost the turret weapon keyword that will now be hitting on a 4 plus. If you want to hit on a 3 plus, you need an order, but at least in 10th edition, you still have the insurance against getting locked up in combat. Now all the weapons will be able to fire out of melee, albeit at the minus one to hit. Overall still seems at least fairly intimidating, though maybe just a tiny bit of a tone down in raw power for the points cost. For the standard Russ, it's kind of interesting. I feel like the battle cannon profile has been made a bit weedy. It's lost AP to AP1. It only hits on a 4+, plus, as we said. It's gained up to strength 10, but that's actually worse against a bunch of targets. For example, it would have been wounding other Rosses on a 4+, plus before. Now it'll be a 5+. Plus. And to cap it all, there's just a chance of being out of range now, as its range has dropped down to 48 inches from 72. It seems that the Lehman Russ battle tank, though, has found a bit more of a niche. It does get an innate reroll of hit rolls of 1 against literally everything that it targets, but it gets absolutely brutal against units on objectives, allowing it to reroll all hit rolls against them. And potentially that could even be interesting for born soldiers if you can trigger it. If you're wounding on a 5 or 6, you could maybe fish for those auto wounds and just reroll everything. That's going to be a massive deal and it's a huge boost to the damage output. I feel like that's enough to make up for the worsen battle cannon profile. Though it does make the Ross very swingy, kind of okay against most things, but actually genuinely threatening against units on objectives. Moving through the other Ross turrets though, next up we have the Demolisher, 220 points, so 25 points more than the standard Ross. He's the most expensive non-tank commander variant. Compared with the Battle Cannon, the Demolisher profile is kind of brutal. D6 plus 3 shots at strength 14, AP3 and damage D6. Pretty effective against just about anything that you throw that against, and really quite a dedicated anti-tank weapon as well, with a strength 14 there. 
Obviously, you're paying quite a lot more points for it, but it does feel like it's on another level compared with the Battle Cannon. Doesn't get the rerolls though. The Demolisher special rule is called Line Breaker. This one's somewhat similar to the Space Marine Vindicator. It can fire within engagement range with blast weapons, so you can literally fire the Demolisher Cannon at point blank range, and it ignores the penalty for doing so as well. Really quite handy with a tank that's quite likely to be on the front lines. It basically means that this thing just doesn't have its firepower degraded by being locked up by enemy infantry for once. They're not going to be able to stop that Demolisher Cannon firing to full effect. Next up, we've got the Vanquisher at 190 points, so a little bit cheaper than the standard Ross. The Vanquisher Cannon gets the heavy keyword, so if you do manage to remain stationary with it, then it could hit on a 2 plus with a tank order. It has become a bit more of a niche anti tank type weapon, though, as it no longer ignores invulnerable saves. And unlike things like the Tau and Votan rail weapons, it doesn't have devastating wounds either, so even on a 6, you can't be trading that out for mortals. Instead, what it gets is a reroll to wound versus monsters and vehicles. If it managed to smash through their defences, then it gets damage D6 plus 2, a decent chance of ending a vehicle's life in a single shot. Just on average damage, it does around about 5 or 6 wounds to a Rhino, or 4 or 5 to a Land Raider. That's turn on turn average, obviously in very big increments, and is very swingy. The Demolisher Cannon will beat those numbers by a little bit, but not by all that much. Though I feel like the two have a few pros and cons. The Demolisher is definitely shorter range and costs more, but it's also a lot more general purpose as well. Far better against infantry, and also a bit less likely to have its damage output just turned off by a single command point reroll of a 4 plus invulnerable save. I have a feeling that this might well put it back in the category of just being a bit too swingy and a bit too niche to be general purpose. With the bonus mortal wound damage output that it had before, it was at least a little bit useful against heavy infantry, even if it wasn't optimal. Next up, we've got the Punisher for 180 points, the joint cheapest Ross with the Eradicator. The Punisher Gatling Cannon lost a little bit of AP, and interestingly seems to have a different strength printed here on its profile compared with the Armoury profile. I guess that the strength 6 is probably the right one though. In exchange for the AP loss, it became a bit more focused against anti-infantry, Against anything that isn't a monster or vehicle, it gained devastating wounds. You should average about one or two mortal wounds against your target with that. Otherwise, though, it's going to be fairly similar to what it was before. Pretty decent against light infantry, could take a few pot shots and chip damage on heavies. Going to be a lot less efficient than the others against anything like vehicles. Next up, we've got one of the Terrors of Ninth Edition in the Lehman Rust Plasma Cutioner. 195 points for a Lehman Rust with an Executioner Plasma Cannon. That perhaps broadly doesn't seem to be enormously massively changed. The cannon lost a little bit of AP, though it's still pretty decent at AP3. I think it's more the case that all the toughness changing around it will make it a lot more anti-infantry and a lot less good against big armour. It's gone from wounding most vehicles on either a 4+, plus or a 3+, plus up to a 5+. plus. The new hazardous rule might be a little bit better for it, though. Previously, you might have averaged about one mortal wound on yourself if you'd overcharged without getting any rerolls. Now it's going to be about half that per turn. And it could be a bit more worth command point re-rolling as well, as with the new hazardous rule that's either 3 mortal wounds or none. Still looks fairly solid, its special rule is a plus 1 to hit below half strength units. Not really very reliably useful in my opinion, but it will come up from time to time. I'm a little bit unsure between this one and the Lehman Rust Battle Tank, which one might generally tend to take off a bit. I feel like the big re-rolls for the Lehman Rust Battle Tank are a significant advantage, though getting a massive AP-3 is so much better than AP-1. Next up, we've got a Rust that's got a lot more interesting with a Lehman Rust Exterminator. This one's 200 points, a little bit more than the Battle Cannon Rust, and it's kind of interesting because I feel like it's a lot more valuable for its special rule than just its raw damage profile. The big gun really is quite a lot more dangerous though, 48 inches and rapid fire 4, so that's 8 shots within 24 inches, strength 9, AP minus 1, damage 3, and also twin linked as well. So you re-roll in the wound roll, and unlike the standard Lehman Rust battle tank, you even get the re-rolls against things that aren't on objectives. Overall, it's definitely a massively better profile compared with the one that it had previously, perhaps compared with the standard Ross a bit better at punching up against big armour, and a little bit less effective against dealing with hordes, though still not bad. Its special rule though really does look pretty excellent. If you shoot a unit with those improved auto cannons, the rest of your guard army gets an extra pip of AP when you target the same unit, and that could be pretty awesome for focusing fire with the rest of your gun line. Fire this first, and then everything from your last guns to your last cannons will be getting extra AP against the target that you want to bring down. Overall, looks pretty tempting, I think. I think just for that special rule alone, I feel like you could have one of these in your army pretty justifiably. Perhaps even more than one, as the damage profile definitely isn't too bad, and they could even help each other out with the first one marking and getting more AP for the second. Finally, we've got the Lehman Ross Eradicator, which I feel like has perhaps got the short end of the stick once again. I guess it's 180 points, so it is perhaps the cheapest Ross. 
but I feel like the gun is just near enough outclassed both by the Executioner and by the Exterminator. It does get a few more shots with D3 plus 6 shots, and it does ignore cover, but the shots are made at strength 7, AP minus 1, and damage 2, so it's generally pretty poor AP and damage really. I feel like it has perhaps narrowed the gap compared with the others, compared with what it was in 9th edition, which wasn't that great. I suppose at least it does cost a bit cheaper, which is definitely an advantage. For its rule, again, it's maybe one that's not too bad to have on the front lines, a similar sort of engagement range type rule to the Lehman Rust Demolisher, so if enemies tag it, then it won't be minus 1 to hit, which is kind of nice. Finally for the Lehman Russes, I thought it was probably worth talking about the Tank Commander here as well. The new version of the Tank Commander is 240 points, so very very pricey there, and probably not something that you're going to want a whole load of. The Tank Commander gets to pick up your choice of the different turrets, I suppose that means that maybe going for the Demolisher might be one of the better ones. Though I feel that that's perhaps a bit unfortunate in line with keeping the Tank Commander in harm's way. Otherwise perhaps I suppose the Executioner Plasma Cannon might not be the worst. Definitely losing a fair bit of hitting power, but at least you gain a bit of range. And it's one of the ones that's less dependent on special rules to be good. Otherwise, though, he gets one tank order, ordering one tank within 12 inches to be plus one to hit, or get one of the other buffs. And it could be quite a nice one to put Grand Strategist on if you want to go all in on one vehicle. Having two tank orders coming out of one commander seems nice. For its special rule, it basically gets the new version of Vengeful Salute from the last codex. A 2 plus chance to fire on death on 4 wounds remaining, hopefully taking a big chunk out of one of your opponent's units before it goes, really quite a nice thing to have on tanks moving aggressively. I feel like between this rule and the tank orders, it probably does do enough to justify itself at the points cost. I do feel like it's something that you can't really afford to have too many of though, maybe just one of these, perhaps two at maximum, and then go heavy on the Russes. I think Lord Solar is perhaps a more efficient choice for tank commanders if you want him. He does only go to 6 inches, but he does get 3 for much cheaper cost. Finally, for the non-super heavy battle tanks, we've got the Mighty Rogue or Dawn. 285 points, so kind of similar to what it was before. It is the biggest thing with the squadron keyword, so it's quite a good focal point for single unit orders. I feel like you could definitely pair a tank commander with one. Stats wise, it's gained a bit in endurability. Toughness 12, a 2 plus save, and 18 wounds. Last cannons will still be wounding it on a 4+, plus, and lots of things will be wounding it on 5s as before. It's also got quite a nice rule baked in called Ablative Plating. Once per game you'd get to change an attack's damage characteristic to 0, so you'd use that on a really big scary hit, like something like a Tower Railgun, or some enemy melt with D6 plus 2 damage, and just make that go away. It essentially means that this thing does basically have more wounds baked into its profile, as you're always going to guarantee that you nullify at least some damage with that. I think it's also quite like the new degrading rules, it's going to have to go all the way down to 6 wounds before you're hitting on a 5, and that is rather nice. Otherwise, it's got Objective Control 5, not the worst to have towing onto an objective. The Oppressor Cannon and the Battle Cannon seem a lot better balanced than they were before now. They've got the same number of shots, but they also have the same number of damage. You either get the Twin Linked Rule to B-roll the Wound Roll, or you get the Oppressor Cannon's Strength 12 and AP-2. I feel like those two profiles are kind of close and better at different things. It is definitely a little bit less fearsome than it used to be though. Otherwise though, I guess quite a lot of its peripheral guns got better. You now have more shots coming out of those stubbers, potentially 18 of them within half range. You can afford to put multi-melters on the sponsons as they're just the same as heavy bolters now. That seems rather good for an aggressive one. And out of the whole guns now, I think that the pulverizer cannon is probably the way to go. I felt that they were kind of balanced before, but that's got a solid boost. D6 shots at strength 9, AP3 and damage 3. Previously it had only AP minus 2, and I think that's enough to tip the balance. It's quite a good weapon for taking out space marines of most flavours. Overall I still think that the Dawn looks like a really interesting unit. A bit less raw damage on the main cannon, but a lot more on the peripheral guns. Still hard to kill, and doubly so with ablative plating. And still an excellent choice for focal boosts. Beyond the battle tanks, we've still got really quite a lot of guard armour to go. The Hellhounds are 125 points now. They've actually got a fair bit tougher with a toughness of 10 and going up to a 2 plus save with 11 wounds. I think they'll also enjoy movement not degrading either, which is quite nice with the auto hitting weapons. They'll be able to move around maximally for the rest of the game, but they will be going a little bit slower at 10 inches rather than 12. For the weapons, the Chem Cannon is now anti infantry on a 2 plus, AP 2 and damage 2 with around 4 or 5 shots on average. The Inferno Cannon's a bit longer ranged, about 7 shots with strength 6, AP 2 and damage 1. A bit more specs for light infantry versus the chem cannon's heavy infantry. And then if you want close range armour, the melter cannon lost a bit of range so it's only 18 inches now. It hits on a 4+, plus, but if you can get it all the way up close, it's got the melter 4 keyword now. So it's absolutely brutal within 9 inches. 
The Hellhound special rule is to strip cover from one unit that it got hit. Definitely not a terrible thing to have in 10th edition, cover saves aren't the hardest to come by. I feel like with the points and damage profiles it might well be a unit that again perhaps you just want one or two of at max. Have the ability to strip cover somewhere in the army and also just be a perhaps surprisingly tough and annoying unit to move up towards the enemy. 2 plus armour is rather nice on this thing. Next up we've got the Scout Sentinel which I think is one of the real winners of the Codex. 1-3 to three models at 50 points each, perhaps proving that Games Workshop do indeed know how to give a per model points cost if they want to. Scout Sentinels, despite being very good before, seem to be just massively improved all round. A little bit pricier in terms of cost, but it gets all its gear free now. It's a decent amount tougher, going up to toughness 7, and perhaps more importantly a 3 plus save. Not bad in 10th edition where AP is a bit lower. Still remarkably durable. It has traded its infiltrate for a Scout's 9 inches move, and lost a little bit of movement to 10, though still not too bad on the speed front compared with other guard units. It now gets its Hunter Killer Missile baked in, and that's very scary with Strength 14 and AP 3. Quite a big shot there. The Chainsaw's free as well, though it's a bit less threatening without damage too. Still could take a chunk out of Light Infantry if they charge something and couldn't kill it though. Broadly speaking, there's similar changes to the other war gear as well. Maybe the Last Cannon still being one of the more interesting things, actually being properly threatening against armour. I think the Scout Sentinel has two other really big advantages though. First up, you get to mark a target for the rest of your army to shoot at. Pick one unit within 18 inches, the rest of your army just gets to re-roll hit rolls of 1 against that unit, so a nice direct increase to your other unit's firepower there. I think that's already very solid for 50 points to be honest, but on top of that, if you have artillery as well, then they also get to ignore the penalty for indirect fire against that unit, it means that you can have your basilisks and manticores hitting on a 3 plus with a heavy keyword, and the opponent won't suddenly gain the benefit of cover. Really quite big, at least on first takes, the artillery does seem pretty efficient, particularly with lethal hits. I feel like a trio of individual ones of these to hand out those debuffs seems pretty excellent. Overall just really good value for the points, and I feel like you could even justify a big unit of three of them if you wanted. Send them up towards the enemy and just make them have to deal with 21 wounds worth of 3 plus save toughness 7. When they eventually do, you can then just respawn it for 2 command points as it has the regiment keyword, and just have it turn up on reinforcements again at the side of the board. Overall it looks like a really good unit, I definitely expect to see them in competitive lists. The Armoured Sentinels I think are kind of interesting, as technically the most value that you can get out of the reinforcement stratagem, at 70 points each. Compared with the Scout Sentinels, their toughness 8 and a 2 plus save, so they are significantly more durable. Admittedly that is on a per model basis though, I think once you've accounted for the extra 20 points or so, I feel like it's a lot more even, if not even in the Scout Sentinels' favour against some firepower. They're also slower, don't scout, though their special rule is decent enough. Reroll wound rolls against monsters and vehicles if your opponent happens to have any of those. Seems reasonable enough to equip them with something like a plasma cannon, auto cannon, or last cannon with that, perhaps. The hunter killers will really like it quite a lot too. Unless you know that your opponent's definitely going to be fielding droves of monsters and vehicles, though, I'd certainly be looking towards the scout sentinel before these, though. Next up for artillery, we've got the basilisk, much cheaper than it was before at 110 points, though the earthshaker cannon profile is also a fair bit tamer. It's only strength 8 and AP minus 2, though it's kept much of the other same stats, d6 plus 3 shots, and usually hitting on a 3 before any indirect penalties, due to the heavy keyword. For indirect shooting though, I still think that that's absolutely fine. Perhaps particularly so just because of the sheer amount of buffs that you could be getting on focused artillery fire in 10th edition. You could be using scout sentinels to mark the targets and remove the barrage buffs and give you rerolls. That's drastium for an extra plus 1 to hit, or the exterminator perhaps to give you extra AP, as well as a master of ordnance and your inbuilt lethal hits. Genuinely quite scary for a gun that can remain safe for most of the game. Even just on its base profile though, it's fine enough. Three dead termagants, around one or two space marines, or around about two wounds to a rhino tank. Genuinely not too bad when it's focused on the thing that's most important out of line of sight. Really though, the damage output of the basilisk does come down a bit, I think, because of the Earthshaker rounds rule that it has. I think it pays a little bit of a premium to get this rule, as it slows down an enemy infantry unit with minus two to their move, advance and charge. Against some enemy armies, that's going to have just as much value as the actual damage output of the gun. If you could slow down a big terminator blob down to an absolute crawl and keep it out of the game for one more turn, then the tank's probably done its job, even if it doesn't even manage to kill more than one or two of them. Seems decent, as with a fair few of these things with these cool special rules, perhaps seems like it's worth having one of them in the list as a priority, and then you might look at other data sheets like the Manticore if you wanted to spam more indirect. Speaking of which, the Manticore is slightly cheaper than the Basilisk now, and it does seem to be the option that you want to go for if you just literally want more heavy firepower out of it. 
and a bit less utility from its special rule. The new Manticore profile sort of flipped again with the Basilisk, going up to strength 10, AP 2 and damage 3. It does get a few less shots though at D6 plus 1 shots rather than D6 plus 3. Overall I think that still gives it a bit of a niche against say Toughness 9 and Toughness 10 vehicles and 3 wound infantry in particular as well. I did notice too that the Manticore has also lost the special rule for only firing 4 times per game. I guess that somewhere along the way someone finds the time to put one of those Storm Eagle rockets back on it for turn 5. Otherwise though the Manticore has got a fairly brutal damage dealing special rule called a Furious Barrage. Against enemy units with 5 or more models in them it gets to just flat out re-roll the hit. Pretty excellent when you're often going to be hitting on a 4 plus unless you get external buffs from somewhere. That will put it slightly ahead of the Basilisk against any infantry units with those numbers in. So perhaps in an artillery section if you were going big on them, perhaps one Basilisk and then a few more Manticores if you want to go heavy. At 105 points though it does seem really efficient, particularly with all the other buffs on offer as we've mentioned. Artillery are definitely looking strong in this new guard index. Moving on we've got the Hydra. 95 points, so nice and cheap anti-air here. I feel like the Hydra's profile has taken a bit more of a side grade. They're genuinely really quite efficient at 110 points in the previous decks. They're now strength 9, AP minus 1 and damage 3 on the auto cannons, but lost AP and traded their 8 shots out for re-roll wound rolls. Overall, really quite a lot of changes. I feel like after you add everything up, it probably amounts to around about the same against most targets. Probably not going to achieve wonders on its own, only averaging 2 hits each time it shoots, but at least those hits will quite reliably wound, and they come through with big damage if the opponent fails a save. As you'd expect though, it is going to come into its own against fly targets. It wounds those on a 2+, plus, so it's even more reliable than the re-roll to wounds it has already, and it also gets to re-roll the hit roll as well. So unless you've got a minus 1 debuff, you're often going to be hitting with 3 shots rather than 2. On average, you get around about 1 or 2 wounds through against a fly vehicle with a 3 plus save. Not too bad, probably what I'd expect for 95 points and being fairly tough for that cost, I guess. Next up, we've got some more artillery in the Wyvern. 90 points here and solid anti infantry. Really quite a lot cheaper than it was before. The Stormshard Mortar is now 2d6 shots, and again, like the Hydra, basically trades fewer shots for twin links. And they're kind of helpful for taking down lighter infantry as they ignore cover as well so the indirect bonus won't be handing that out to them. Overall, perhaps somewhat similar. It will be hitting a bit better as well with a heavy keyword, so it'll usually be hitting on 4s out of line of sight, unless you focus other buffs. It's still perhaps not enormously exciting in terms of damage output, around about 2 termagants or about 1 wound to space marines, and again maybe perhaps feels a bit in the same boat as the Basilisk maybe. Its rule is called Suppression Bombardment. You hand out a minus 1 to hit to one enemy unit that got hit by the Wyvern, and again with the order that might be quite good for just targeting one big scary enemy unit. Anything that isn't a monster or vehicle gets a minus one to hit. And that could be quite nice if you think it's a unit that's going to jump out and deal you some serious damage. Finally for big artillery we've got the Death Strike Missile. 135 points and a similar sort of designate target type rule to how it had before. Again like previous you spend one turn putting a marker down on the board. Then your opponent has to try and scramble out of the way of it if they care too much. And then in your next turn, you have the opportunity to either fire or reposition the firing targets. The damage output of this thing used to have three different warhead choices, now it's just the one. This one has a lot wider area of effects, but maybe isn't quite as dangerous. 2d6 hits, hitting on a 2+, plus, strength 16, AP 4, but only damage 1. Sounds kind of impressive, but realistically it's probably going to only add up to, say, around about 5 wounds to light infantry. Or maybe around about 2 or 3 space marines or 1 terminator dead. Basically I think that this thing needs to be able to threaten lots of units to be able to actually make itself worth it. And perhaps as with before, it's maybe a little bit more powerful to perhaps control enemy movement as opposed to actually the damage output it might wind up doing. Certainly could be annoying for your opponent to have to try and scatter from it now, as certain units that might not be able to escape its wrath without advancing. But I feel like in general you're going to struggle to hit too many targets with this. Not unless your opponent has got absolutely loads of units that all move quite slowly and for whatever reason can't afford to advance. At 135 points I guess it's not the biggest investment in the world and it definitely could cause some irritation to your opponent castling in certain areas of the board until it's destroyed or it fires. Transport's next and next we have the Chimera for 85 points. Again fairly cheap and cheerful. This thing transports 12, heavy weapon teams take 2 and ogrins take 3. It's gained 2 models on the firing deck. So it's quite nice that you can do a bit of a drive-by with this should you want to. Maybe open up with some plasma or melter from within the tank maybe. Like a few of the vehicles it's gained a slightly higher toughness profile but lost a bit of movement. I feel like in some ways it might be more useful and in some ways less useful. 
Transport vehicles certainly seem to have been improved a fair bit in 10th edition. You'll be able to move them along and then get the squad out, which is kind of exactly what guards want to do. They get to move out and jump onto an objective and then still shoot to full effect. I feel like the orders thing is kind of annoying for a lot of transports though, as it now means that the unit inside of it won't be able to get an order. Though if you do have an officer inside a Chimera specifically, they would be able to issue an order to something else within range. That still could be pretty helpful and maybe makes it a better transport if you're taking a squad with an officer. Otherwise, with the points cost, it now comes with a bolt-in stubber and a hunter-killer missile. If you take the heavy bolters, they've now gained sustained hit. If you take heavy flamers, they've gained ignore cover. I must admit, I'm a little bit confused as to why they've decided to separate out the Chimera heavy bolter and the regular heavy bolter profile along with the rest. They do just seem to be exactly the same stats. It still gets the last gun arrays as well. They're just consolidated into one single profile. It still looks like you can fire them just fine, even if there's no one in the hold. Overall, for a pretty cheap transport, it's really bristling with quite a lot of guns now. Just one Chimera at 12 inch range could be putting out 25 shots just under its own steam, plus also two extra weapon profiles fired from the hold as well. Not too bad anti-light infantry there. Otherwise, the Torox is looking very, very cheap. 65 points now, and transports 12 once more. It seems to have had this transport capacity increased to deal with the extra characters that we might have now. As with the Chimera, it seems great for doing a move up and disembark a unit, and in 10th edition, as with Arcs of Omen, it'll also have that transport change where you also need to start a unit inside it, otherwise it counts as destroyed right from the start of the game. It means that you can't just run a bunch of interference ones of these without any infantry units in them, if that might have tempted you for some random armor spam. Otherwise, it's still faster than the Chimera, though it's also lost movement. The Toughness 8 is a bit more middling and will be threatened a lot more by things like overcharged plasma, and it has picked up the new auto cannon profile, which while it's still not super threatening, isn't too bad at damage 3. Its special rule is that it allows you to disembark a unit even after the Torox has advanced. Probably not something you were going to want to do most of the time, as that would stop you from firing your auto cannons. But if it makes the few extra inches difference of getting onto an objective or getting into range of a target, it might well be worth sacrificing that fire. It seems that transports still do gain the squadron keyword as well, if you wanted to order them. Though I think in general that's not going to happen quite as much. Tank orders are a little bit harder to come by. I suppose perhaps the move 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 one could be useful though. Super Heavy is next, and we'll start out with the Mighty Baneblade. 540 points worth of guard armour, still comfortably more than two Lehman Rosses put together. Baneblades do have a very big chunky profile, toughness 13, so last cannons wound them on fives, a 2 plus save, and 24 wounds. Will be very tough against most things, but truly dedicated anti-armour in a big way will still bring it down quite quickly. Previously it was 30 wounds and toughness 9, I think overall durability is perhaps kind of similar. A lot of things did lose AP in 10th edition, even heavy anti-tank guns. As with the Lehman Rosses and the Rogal Dawn, sponsons are now basically auto-include on this thing due to 10th edition's locked points. It means you are basically paying for the extra last cannons and extra heavy bolts or flamers, so you may as well take the second set. Does mean that you've just got a rolling fortress just covered with a ton of guns. I feel like the heavy flamers could be perhaps particularly interesting. Four twin heavy flamers plus the rest of the guns of the tank have some pretty massive overwatch potential. If you did set it up just within range of an objective to make sure you could barbecue anything that stood on it. Otherwise the Baneblade cannon is a little bit toned down but it's still broadly very general purpose. Strength 12, AP 2 and damage 3 and a bunch of shots. It's on 4s now without the turret keyword. A lot more of the damage comes proportionately from the Demolisher cannon now. That got buffed along with the Rosses. Strength 14 and damage D6 and more shots than it had previously. Otherwise the Baneblades have a huge explosion if they blow up. Battleshock on a 7 plus is perhaps kind of surprising for it, and again like the others it won't degrade quite as painfully, really quite important on a big thing that might well survive, it'll have a lot of wounds to go between half damage and dead. Overall looks kind of interesting, I still have a feeling it might struggle a fair bit compared with Rosses and Dawns, each of the Baneblade tanks also gets their own special rule as well, this one's is Rolling Fortress, providing cover to any guard units partially obscured by it, in theory you could make yourself a bit of a pleasing arrowhead formation, the Bane Blade partially obscuring a couple of Rosses behind it, maybe. Otherwise, we've also got the many flavours of Bane Blade, all of which are cheaper than the actual Bane Blade itself. I guess it is fairly general purpose between the Great Big Cannon and the Demolisher. The Bane Hammer's 490 points. This one gets the Tremor Cannon, pretty well the same profile as the Bane Blade Cannon, but at shorter range. This one also hands out a Battleshock test and can do for units nearby. It's also got a decent transport capacity as well. I feel like it does look like a pretty interesting alternative to the Bane Blade, particularly if you want to transport a unit, 
I feel like the main trade-off, though, is 50 points cheaper for no Demolisher Cannon. Next up, we've got the Bane Sword, one of the other anti-armor ones, and this one's an extra 35 points less than the Bane Blade. This one gets the Quake Cannon, D6 plus 6 shots here, Strength 16, AP 4, and Damage 4. This one ignores cover as well, so quite unlikely that a lot of things are getting saves here unless they've got invulnerables. This one's a lot more dedicated anti-armor than the previous two, with the better AP and better strength. It does have a really fun special rule as well, in that it triggers Deadly Demise on a 3+, plus rather than a 6. Against the right army, that could be truly terrifying, making a vehicle go pop in the middle of their formation. Some of them in 10th edition do have some pretty big profiles like that. If it shot down another super heavy, then that could be D6 plus 2 mortal wounds to everyone around. Realistically though, I guess your opponent would see that coming if you have the unit in your army. Next up, we've got the Doom Hammer, which is one of the cheaper ones. Only 455 here, so around about 2 Rust Demolishers in points cost. Again, this one's got a transport capacity with a firing deck, and this one strikes with a magma cannon. Just D6 plus 3 shots here, and it's only strength 12, but it does go off at AP minus 4 and damage D6 with the absolutely crazy Melter 6 rule, and its special rule is to get that Melter hits against vehicles that are within the full 24 inch range. In general they do tend to be the ones that you're most needed against really, you don't really need damage 6 against most infantry and bikes, though it would help out a little against terminators and heavy bikers. Seems interesting, maybe just like a Lehman Rust Demolisher but more, still not maybe quite as hyper specialised as things like the Vanquisher or Shadow Sword either. Next up we've got the Hellhammer, which still is kind of similar to its previous version in the Guard Codex rather than what it was before. 46 shots at 30 inch range, strength 7, AP minus 1, damage 2, and ignores cover. This one is decently cheaper than the Bane Blade, but it also gets the Demolisher Cannon as well. I guess that does make it at least fairly general purpose, and also cannon equivalent profile for taking down medium bikers and heavy infantry, and at least something that can threaten tanks between the Demolisher Cannon and all the last cannons. Still perhaps not the most exciting main gun profile in the world though. This one gets a similar sort of rule to the Lehman Rust Demolisher, no minus one to hit for being in engagement range, so it's quite happy being on the front lines compared with some. Next up we've got the Scary Shadow Sword, which is now the cheapest of the variants, down to 440 points. I guess kind of similar to the Lehman Rust Vanquisher, it is a bit hyper specialised and just a little bit unreliable. The Volcano Cannon gets D3 plus 1 shots with a heavy keyword, so if you stay still it gets to hit on a 3. The shots do have a kind of hilarious stat line at strength 24, AP 5 and damage 12, usually that's wounding on 2s, and you do actually get the small chance for devastating wounds on this. If you target monsters or vehicles, then 6s will just give you a casual 12 mortal wounds. Basically this thing is going to be ridiculously scary to anything that's got 12 wounds or less, and doesn't have an invulnerable save. It's certainly going to worry things that they do as well, and will definitely be having them worried on the roll. It is just a lot more matchup specific compared with the other Bane Blades though. If you're fighting against even heavier infantry, it's just not going to have the same sort of value any way, shape or form, and you might have been better off with one of the other big turrets. The Stormlord's the big transport one with that Vulcan Mega Bolter, 20 shots at strength 6, now AP minus 1 and damage 2. It's basically traded out some AP for sustained hits 1 on those attacks, and still say with that maybe not the most exciting in the world. Out in the open it would kill around about 4 or 5 dead space marines, though that does go down a fair bit if they get cover. Can still at least threaten lighter vehicles like rhinos, taking around 4 or 5 wounds off them. It's perhaps just not enormously ahead of a few of the other turrets though, given that they can also take down big tanks and vehicles as well. Definitely not awful though, as one of the cheaper variants, and of course this one you might well just be taking for the transport capacity, which has the ridiculous 40 strong one. Transport rules in 10th edition did get a lot more interesting, and it also got a very cool rule as well, allowing you basically a reactive re-embarkation of your unit. At the end of your opponent's movement phase, if it makes sense, you can just get the squad back into the transport, provided it had nothing else in it. Seems kind of good for an option for most units, Weirdly enough, I feel like it could be kind of interesting for getting Ogren into range with those 9-inch Ripper guns. If you can move this thing up the board, then you could be getting them out and spouting off 36 shots with that profile, and then hopefully have them just retreat inside the tank when the opponent tries to take some revenge. Next up, we've got the Storm Sword for 520 points, just a little bit cheaper than the Bane Blade here and the second most expensive. This one gets a very punchy Storm Sword Siege Cannon, D6 plus 6 shots at strength 16, AP minus 4, and a massive damage D6 plus 2. Compared with the Bane Blade, it is a bit more focused on anti-armor. It's just a massive gun that's pretty much scary against literally anything that it goes against, and it isn't even really averaging much fewer shots than the Bane Blade cannon itself. 
kind of feels like if you wanted the Bane Blades, but you wanted the Demolisher Cannon plus the Bane Blade Cannon just squished together in one enormous dangerous profile. It also gets a fun special rule called Concussive Wave as well, where every unit within 3 inches of your target gets a 5 plus to date D3 mortal wounds, including the actual unit that you shot if it's still standing. A bit unreliable, but maybe just gives you a little bit more of an incentive to take down something in the middle of a big formation. You might get a tiny bit more scattered damage. Overall, I feel like they've done a fairly decent job of balancing these a little bit better now. It will be interesting to see which ones shake out as the more commonly played ones. I might have to try and revisit it and do a bit of a math hammer on the main guns in another video at some stage. I feel like for a lot of these, it's still mainly the main gun stats, plus perhaps transport capacity that's making them the most interesting. Some of their special rules seem quite good, but I feel like they may be a bit more peripheral than some units. Next up, we've got the Faction's Flyer in the Valkyrie, which has gone up to a rather depressing 200 points. I think that is a bit much for it, to be honest. And for this profile, I can't really see it being played all that much. The Valkyrie still transports 12. It's lost any Tempestus or Aeronautica and Imperialis keywords, though it can still have a bit of synergy with the Officer of the Fleet, as we'll see in a second. The Valkyrie is going to be using both the new Flyer and the new Transport rules, either starting in hollow mode and having a 20 inch move, or starting off the board and having to come in via strategic reserve, it's lost the minus one to hit, the fly keyword perhaps looks a little bit less good with terrain, and while the transport move and disembark things are rather good for it, and at least it can start on the board now, I feel like it's perhaps paying a big premium to be able to move and drop its units right from turn one, and you could potentially do that for a fair few units with something a bit smaller like a Torox that only costs 65 points. Otherwise for the unit changes, perhaps one of the biggest is it's gained toughness 10 and a 2 plus save. It's a bit harder to take down, though at 200 points it's perhaps not so exciting. Otherwise there haven't been an enormous amount of changes to the weapons. The Hellstrikes have picked up Anti-Fly 2 plus, which is useful. Morty Rocket Pods have lost some AP. Its special rule is Grav Shoot Insertion. This one allows you to get units out of the transport in the opponent's movement phase. So kind of like Rapid Ingress, but getting out of a transport. I guess theoretically you might be able to use that for either setting yourself up an easy charge the next turn or getting yourself very close with some melter weapons. I feel like in reality though it's just going to be a bit situational compared with what your opponent does and maybe a bit less reliable than just zooming the Valkyrie up and jumping the squad out anyway. The unit inside also needs to have the deep strike keyword as well so it's basically just scions that do that. Overall I feel like the profile is interesting enough, it's definitely very tough and could get one squad to exactly where it needs to be in style. I just think that 200 points is paying far too much for a premium for that, unfortunately. Just far better to have more squads doing the same thing on the ground out of Toroxes or Chimeras. And if you want more wounds of vehicle, maybe put them on Russes or some other threatening tank. For the Guard's Fortification, we've got the Aegis Defence line, which has seen a rather interesting change. Again, I think it's probably a bit on the pricey size to be very reliable for the Guard, but perhaps seems interesting enough for screening parts of your home deployment zone. The Aegis defence line is now a very pricey 145 points, and now it's a profile that can actually be attacked and destroyed. Seems to be a somewhat common theme with that 10th edition, that fortifications are generally not going to be just battlefield terrain. I think the biggest change of it having a profile means that enemy units won't just literally be able to walk right up to it and over it, they'd actually need to attack it and destroy it if they want to breach it. Looks like you could make yourself a little bit of a guard castle within your deployment zone, that the opponent would have to breach some walls before they get in. For the actual infantry standing behind it and manning the emplacement platform, you get the benefit of cover as you'd hope, but you also get a 4 plus invulnerable save as well. Really quite nice for guard infantry that aren't particularly renowned for being enormously tough like that. Certainly seems solid enough, perhaps for some field ordnance batteries, or maybe heavy weapons teams and things, or just lots and lots of infantry that will be annoying to kill. As for the new movement phase rules, it wouldn't stop you moving through it if you've got infantry doing so, and I don't think it would even block your tanks either. I feel like on paper it's interesting, but again, probably at 145 points, just not quite interesting enough. 10 wounds at toughness 12 is quite tanky, but just perhaps not enormously more so than, say, a Lehman Ross or a Hellhound or something. And it is perhaps a unit that your opponent just doesn't necessarily have to deal with until they actually need to, though it could make target priority with them killing your infantry a bit awkward. It does seem fun though, it could be interesting to have your deployment zone battened down by this, unless your opponent had lots of anti-tank and just removes it easily. Next up, before we get into characters, let's talk through the Militarum Tempestus units for the Astra Militarum. The Stormtrooper Scions are now 60 points for 5 or 120 points for 10 and still get all of their special weapons baked in. They've got the Regiment but not the Platoon keyword, so you could recycle them with that reinforcement stratagem if you wanted to. And with the rare rules interaction that they published last week, it does sound like you'd be able to deep strike them again coming out of strategic reserve. 
Otherwise, the weapons are pretty similar to the Kazakin. The hotshots have unfortunately lost a little bit of AP, so perhaps more focus on the specials. And their special rule kind of mirrors the Lehman Rosses. You get to re-roll once to hit, but if the opponent is on an objective marker, you get to re-roll the hit roll instead. A very nice damage boost all around. Overall, still seem interesting, perhaps most so if they can target something on an objective. And they do have some interesting enough support options. You can attach two different characters to them, and they can be battle line as well if you take the next option, the Tempestus Command Squad. Speaking of which, the Tempestus Command Squad is 5 models for 80 points. That's only 20 more than the base Scion Squad, which I don't think is doing too badly considering the buffs that they get. I feel like if you're taking a 10 man unit of Scions, you might consider a 5 man and then just attaching one of these. In terms of what they do, they can issue a single order. It doesn't look like it's restricted just to. It doesn't look like it's restricted to Tempestus Scions or anything as well, so you could potentially order another regiment keyword unit if it made sense. Again, though, they won't be able to do it on the turn that they deep strike. Otherwise, though, the Tempester just gives you sustained hits 1 for their unit as well. A very nice boost to all the squad's weapons. The banner gives you plus 1 objective control. The medic gives you a 6 plus feel no pain. And the master box, should you take it, gives your order range out to 24 inches. Overall, really quite solid options. I feel like between all of that, that's probably worth the extra 20 points over the second half of a Scion squad normally. If you were deep striking, though, I suppose there's the option of really quite a big chunky Scion squad. Five models here, plus the ten from the Scions. That's to be a lot of Stormtrooper glory dropping down to smash the enemy. For the Tempesta's dedicated transport, we've got the Torox Prime. This one's 90 points, so an extra 25 over the standard one. It transports 12 once more, but is only allowed to take Militarum Tempestus units or Astra Militarum infantry characters that are presumably usually going to be attached to such. Weapons-wise, it still hits on a 3+. The Gatling Cannon's lost a bit of AP. The Hotshot Volley Gun is now twin-linked, which again is a bit of a downgrade, and also lost AP. And finally, the Battle Cannon has gained the plus 1 strength and the new Blast keyword. Out of the 3 with the same points cost in 10th, I feel like the missile launches are probably the way to go. The Torox does give a solid damage buff to a disembarking unit now though. It's got one of those rules where if it focuses fire alongside the squad that just disembarks from it, then the squad that gets to disembark gets to re-roll the wound roll. I guess theoretically for the Tempestus Scion squad, that's re-rolling hit rolls and wound rolls, provided they're targeting a squad on an objective, or very nice. I do quite like that rule, will make the Scion squads a lot more tempted to use this as opposed to just deep striking, which often seems like the easier and more reliable delivery option. Next up, let's talk through the guard characters, starting out with all the more generic ones, then going through the epic heroes that you can only field one of. Starting out, the Cadian Castellan is 50 points still. They can lead either Cadian Shock Troops, Infantry Squads, or Kazakin. They're blocked from the Death Core and the Kashchans, apparently. I was kind of wondering if they might have a leadership of 6, but it seems like it's 7, so not really helping out the leadership of the squad there. Commissars are what do that. And in terms of buffs, they give you just one order targeted to one unit within 6 inches, less than the two that they had before, but they do also give you two other helpful buffs. There's Get Back in the Fights to allow your squad to fall back and still shoot. Seems like a very nice to have on both Kazakin and perhaps big massed up infantry squads in the midfield. And also Senior Officer as well, which gives you sustained hits 1 for the unit that's being led. I guess that's the new reinterpretation of the hit reroll aura. Generally seems pretty solid for a frontline unit trying to deal damage to the enemy. I definitely could see a Castellan leading a squad of 20 Cadian shock troops into battle. Gets them in order, gets them a bit more damage output and ensures that it doesn't get locked up. For the war gear, maybe the Power Fist and Plasma Pistol seem like the best of the choices. Not really too much point in keeping things cheap with a Chainsword now. Otherwise, there's the Platoon Command Squad. These are just 60 points, so just 10 points more than the Castellan. These ones can lead any of the infantry squads besides the Cadian Shock Troops, as you've got the Cadian Command Squad to do those. I think, broadly speaking, it's probably a better support package than just the Castellan for a big unit, maybe. The Medic's really quite nice, giving you a 6 plus feel no pain for the unit. You still get one order, and the Master Vox can throw it out to 24 inches if it makes more sense on something else. And the Banner Bearer gives you plus one objective control. Not too bad for holding midfield points. They can also bear some special weapons as well, with the Spare Guardsman, and the Platoon Commander can still take some fancy gear. I guess compared with the Castellan, it's the Squad versus the Commander, and then whether or not you want extra damage on 6s and the 4 back and shoot, or the Med Pack and the Platoon Command Squad special rule, which is which can still allow you to be targeted with stratagems even if battle shocked. The Cadian Command Squad is 5 points extra compared with the Platoon one. They're 65, and they can only lead the Cadian Shock Troops. Broadly speaking, they're not too different, 
but they must take the specialist, they can't leave them back at home with the Master Vox and the Banner. And then two of the Guardsmen get special weapons, but you can't take any heavy weapons with a veteran heavy weapon team. In place of the Battleshock thing, they grant the Ignores Modifiers rule, so that means I guess that your Guardsmen wouldn't have their characteristics modified, or wouldn't be minus one to hit or wound. Overall, probably a slightly better buff than the Battleshock stratagem thing. I guess they are locks to the Cadian Command Squad though, and you might theoretically want the Platoon Command Squad to lead one of the other units. Overall, both seem solid though. More borders and objectives, plus orders for the unit and a feel no pain. Commissars and the new rules are 35 points. They've removed the Perfectors orders, but they can still issue that Duty and Honor order and fixed bayonets. Probably some of the weakest and most niche of them really. I guess better objective control doesn't exactly hurt though, and fixed bayonets is worth it for the meme potential alone. The Commissars can lead the infantry squads and the regimental variants, Katakin and Tempestus Scions, so are a bit more flexible I suppose. For his other buffs he comes with a leadership of 6+, plus, so that's going to help out the unit against Battleshock there. His summary execution is nice and direct, basically just remove one model from a squad to cancel a Battleshock test. Quite nice that he can do that in other units nearby within 12 inches as well, as well as just his individual one. I feel like if you are going heavy into foot guard and you've got a lot of infantry advancing, one commissar to keep the rest of them in line is probably a good idea. On top of that, he also gets to reroll Battleshock for his own unit if he's also paired with an officer. I guess maybe that's trying to incentivize the slightly more fluffy combination of a commander and a commissar leading together. Overall though, mainly adding a bit of reliability, I feel like you'd probably want a decent amount of infantry to bother with one, but if you've got something like a 100 foot guard heading towards the centre of the board, having a commissar amongst them seems like a good plan. The primary psycho can add a little bit more damage and defence to your unit, 60 points, and he can attach to the same things that the commissar can. For damage he has psychic maelstrom, some fairly punchy anti-infantry shooting, D6 plus 3 shots at strength 6, AP 2 and damage 2 if you overcharge, or with blast and devastating wounds, though if you roll that profile you do have a chance of killing him then and there, keep a CP on standby for the hazardous roll I guess. It's a very good damage profile though, around about 4 dead termagants, 2 dead intercessors, or usually 1 or 2 failed saves to a medium toughness vehicle. Not too bad for a hidden 60 point model within a squad. Otherwise on the defensive he also helps out with a 4 plus feel no pain against psychic attacks, plus has a 2 plus chance to cast psychic barrier. If he manages to get that one off then it's a 4 plus invulnerable save for the unit, making a midfield squad a massive pain to remove. Seems like that could be pretty nice on paper paired with a command squad, get a 6 plus feel no pain, have a 4 plus invulnerable save, and maybe have Deathcore of Creed to regenerate some models. A very tanky unit on objectives there, and all with objective control 3 due to the standards. It is 250 points though, so that's not nothing I suppose. Next we've got some attached units for the command squad. The regimental attaches are 40 points for a trio of these. With that you have to field them all together now, you don't buy them in individually. You get one Master of Ordnance, one Officer of the Fleet, and one Astropath. They have to be filled in with a command squad, so they're basically hangers on there, you can't fill them separately. And in reality, I kind of feel like as a unit they're basically a Master of Ordnance and two hangers on. The Master of the Ordnance declares his buff at the start of the shooting phase, marks one target within 30 inches, and then Astra Militarum Artillery Models get sustained hits one against that targeted unit. Another very good buff for artillery there, combine that with things like Sentinels, Lehman Ross Executioners, or Fields of Fire. Lots of ways to make artillery more dangerous here. Otherwise, the Officer of the Fleet gives you a plus one to hit for aircraft targeting one unit within 30 inches. Doesn't hurt if you happen to be using a Valkyrie anyway, though I think they're a bit on the underwhelming side, as mentioned. Maybe could be interesting enough for the Vulture gunship if that still does get some Forge World rules. The Astropath no longer farms the command points, unfortunately. He now just does a deep strike denial to 12 inches. That's definitely not bad, but it only applies to his model, not to the entire unit, so you're not really screening out all that much. Your opponent might still get 9 inch charges at some points of the squad. Overall, perhaps just a little bit on the expensive side for what they do. The Master of the Ordnance is the biggest draw for me. Otherwise, to add a bit more defence to the squad, there's the option of the Ogre and Bodyguard. 40 points to attach to a command squad. He's got the choice between basically either the 4 plus invulnerable save for the Brute Shield plus more, better melee with the huge knife which is more dangerous than the more, that's strength 8 and 6 attacks, or a bit of shooting picking up a ripper gun, the that one gives you a bit worse combat. In general he just gives you a decent amount more muscle and durability to a command squad, his 6 wounds with a 6 plus feel no pain, maybe that invulnerable save if you take it. That seems pretty solid for 40 points on the face of it. And he also grants a bit of extra durability to the unit against getting sniped, 
A 4 plus fail no pain to any officers in the unit, and if the officer does happen to get injured, then the Ogryn bodyguard gets a plus 1 to hit and wound. Perhaps a bit rare that, I suppose your opponent would have to try and snipe them but not succeed. Overall seems okay if you just want to add some more wounds and durability to your command squad. Unfortunately any healing shenanigans do appear to be gone for this guy, you won't be setting him up with a stratagem or anything again. Even the Death Corps med pack specifies Death Corps troopers and not full on Ogryn bodyguards. Next up, the Regimental Preacher is another quite cheap character upgrade, 35 points and the same sort of options for attachment as the Commissar. Sadly he can't lead either Ogryns or Borgrin, which would be kind of fun, I feel like they could probably have used his combat boost. Otherwise in combat he strikes with a power weapon, a strength 4 AP 2. He can take a holy pistol if he wants, 4-3 strength 4 shots, which is kind of fun. And his boost is 2 grand sustained hits, 1 in melee. Maybe okay in a big 20 strong Kastachan unit, perhaps between the buff and his own re-rollable power weapon attacks. But in reality I feel like sustained hits 1 for the vast majority of units just aren't really going to be worth that cost. I guess perhaps he could be interesting in a Kastachan blob alongside Iron Hand Strachan, as he's got a fairly decent melee profile as well. Next up, and perhaps a bit more interesting, is the Regimental Engine Seer. 45 points for one tech guy to help your tanks. He's got options with what sort of things he leads. He can either join the Infantry Squads and Variants or the Kazakin, a squad of Munitorum Servitors, or just be a lone operative near vehicles, so he can't be shot unless your opponent gets within 12 inches. I feel like his boost in the previous codex was kind of take or leave. Now it's looking a lot better though. Heal D3 wounds to one tank of your choice each turn, but now instead of giving them a 5 plus invulnerable save, it seems he gives them a 4 plus. Seems really excellent, perhaps even auto include on things like a Baneblade tank, maybe even a Rogal Dawn. If he can keep that healing ability going for a few turns, he'll have justified his points cost. And probably just about every time that you ping a Melter weapon off an invulnerable save, that'll also be a big deal as well. For his own personal combat stats, he's also got perhaps a surprisingly decent combat profile as well. 3 attacks at strength 6, AP 2 and damage 2. And like the Tech Marines for the Space Marines, he also goes into Rage Mode and 6 attacks if a vehicle within 12 inches of him gets destroyed at some point. Overall, I think that if you're tank heavy, and particularly if you're running a Rogue or Dawn tank perhaps, this guy does look like a really interesting little support character. The 4 plus invulnerable save, perhaps the best bit, the healing a nice bonus. Next up, we've got his retinue in the Munitorum Servitors. 4 models for 35 points, 2 of them can take heavy weapons. And if the servitors with them and the model stationary, then they get to hit on a 4 plus with them. Otherwise, nothing particularly exciting, they don't help out with repairs or anything like that. Just literally a very cheap bodyguard to protect your tech priest a little bit. And I guess perhaps have some opportunistic melter shots if the opponent gets too close. Not awful, but maybe seems a little bit redundant. I suppose he could use them to add just a few more heavy weapons into an infantry squad that the tech priest had attached to. Plus a couple of very slightly more tanky models with a 4 plus save doesn't particularly hurt especially if you either use the take cover one or can get the benefit of cover. Finally for the Imperial Guard we come to their epic heroes, the named characters, and starting out we've got our faction commander Lord Solar Leontus, 125 points now so significantly cheaper, and he must be the designated warlord if he's around. I guess that would preclude you from using battle line scion squads, so suppose if you want 6 scion squads then you can't fail Mr Leontus. For leading units, he's got the option of the standard infantry squads plus Kazakin and also Attilan Rough Riders as well, where he could go charging into battle with. In terms of raw might, he's lost a bit of power. His toughness has lost his half wounds ability, though still has 8 wounds at a 3 plus save and a 4 plus invulnerable. Not too bad for 125 points. His pistols lost a bit of AP and damage, and his combat's lost a touch of AP, though he has gained some hooves off Constantin. I feel like Lord Solar is just looking very very good value for the points once more. He just gives you an extra command point every single battle round, which is really really nice. More points for sending in some reinforcements I suppose. And then as mentioned, he's got three orders that can be given to any Astra Militarum unit, including things like tank commanders, super heavy vehicles or auxilia, all of which could be interesting in their own right. In particular, I think he could be very interesting for tank orders, if you're willing to bunch them up a little bit. He gets three orders that could be tank orders, a very expensive tank commander only gets you one or two with grand strategists, so he does seem pretty efficient for that. Finally, his college Astralex buff has also been changed a bit. This one allows you to redeploy three Astra Militarum units from your army, and you can put them into strategic reserve. This happens before the roll to see who goes first though, so it's a little bit less valuable. Overall still seems very solid at 125 I think, the orders are very very nice, and he can at least lend a little hand himself in combat, 
a bit of a countercharge unit if the opponent gets too close with some two wound space marines maybe. Perhaps the biggest concern is his bodyguard getting shot down to the extent where he can just get sniped. Might need to play a little bit cagey with him and hide him out behind terrain a bit if you want to keep on farming those command points into the later game. Perhaps another one of the very strongest epic heroes is Ursula Creed, 55 points. She can lead Cadian shock troops, infantry squads or Kazakin. And again, like the other commanders, is still only a leadership 7+, plus, so it doesn't really help you out more than commissars do there. She can chip in with her father's pistols at strength 5, AP-2, as a voice of command order for two different units, which is quite nice in itself. And her thing, more than things like Cadian Castellans, is that she gets you a zero command point stratagem for one unit within 12 inches each battle round. I feel like even if her profile didn't do orders or anything else, that would be quite tempting for 55 points just in itself. You can use that to use more expensive ones like Fields of Fire or the minus one damage for Lehman Rosses. I think it couldn't be used to affect the reinforcement ones though, as I think that happens after the unit's gone. Even if you were just firing that command points into either Overwatch or command point rerolls on big guns though, that's still very good. I feel like between that and two orders, well worth an include. Could even just sit around with a fire base with a bunch of mortars perhaps and hand out the stratagems to some more frontline things like Rosses nearby. Next up we've got Gaunt's Ghosts, 6 models, 415 points. Again they've got their slightly eclectic mix of gear, a bunch of ranged stuff including a big auto cannon with 4 shots from Try Again Brag. Larkin's Lonlaz is an interesting sniper as well with a pretty spooky strength 5 and damage 4. That's getting to the point where one failed save could genuinely take down a light support character. Will be very cool if that ever happens. Otherwise as before they're going to be a squad that's hard to get to grips with. 2 or 3 wound models in the unit if you can target them. They've also got stealth and the benefit of cover all the time with those camo cloaks, and their not being shot trick has got even better with the lone operative keyword now. You can't shoot them outside of 12 inches, does make them a potentially interesting unit to hold down say a home objective or a far flung one in the midfield. In combat they're also quite a risky proposition to charge, they get to fight first, and alongside a whole bunch of silver blades they've got some precision and devastating wound attacks, though it certainly seems they're a lot more threatening at range than they are in melee. They've even got two orders per turn and they can self-order if you want. You could have them hitting better, extra objective control or plus one to their saves. They overall basically feel like an annoying unit to deal with that your opponent might have to invest more effort than they really want to to kill. But in terms of actual damage output probably isn't really going to do all that much. Even if they do have multiple potential threats that could surprise. Nork Deadog is the unique Ogre and Bodyguard. 70 points so an extra 30 points over the regular one. He gets a big knife that gets devastating wounds compared with the standard one that the Ogre and Bodyguard gets. Also gets a Ripper gun and has a feel no pain 5+, plus, so he is a bit harder to kill. His special rule is a thunderous headbutt for D3 mortal wound impact hits. Definitely a bunch of fun rules there. I can't help but think though that for 70 points he is probably going to struggle to justify his inclusion. Just maybe feels a little bit unfocused and generally reactive to the enemy. At 70 points you could be getting entire extra units of guardsmen elsewhere on the board. Definitely looks fun to use though, and certainly would make your opponent think twice about tangling with an infantry squad in the mid board with him attached. Another perhaps interesting lurking guard threat is Ironhand Strachan. He's 80 points, and while he doesn't have the sheer durability of Nork, can hit just as hard if not harder against some things. He also has the scout keyword as well, and joins Katachan jungle fighters, so you could have a fairly scary melee blob in the centre. His bionic arm gets him a 6 attacks at strength 6, AP-2 and damage 2, anti-monster 4+, plus if you happen to be fighting them. His attacks will get lethal hits, as will his squad, which is quite nice on the AP-1 Katachan attacks. And when he charges into combat, he personally gets to reroll all hits and wounds with that really quite nice generalist profile. He does actually have a fairly respectable chance of taking out entire squads of space marines, which is pretty cool for a single guardsman. He even gets two orders as well, and that's kind of nice and better than what, say, Acadian Castellan can get for you. Seems really quite a fun model to have in the front ranks alongside the Kastachan jungle fighters and can definitely help them actually bully other units in combat. Kind of takes them from a threat that can reliably bully light infantry to being able to take out space marines as well. Otherwise we have the man the meme Sly Marbo, 75 points so went up a bit. He's been shifted around a fair bit and now infiltrates rather than deep strike and now both at range and in combat he strikes hitting on a 2 plus, strength 5 AP minus 1 and damage 2. Really quite nice against two wound infantry, and all his attacks have the precision keyword. Seems like he could certainly function as a mini assassin. Hits on twos, wounds infantry on twos as well. There's a pretty reasonable chance he'll be taking out support characters. 
Otherwise, he's a lone operative with stealth. He can return fire if enemies shoot a nearby guard squad, and that would also count if they tried to target him as well and they're within 12 inches. I guess perhaps the only minor disappointment is his points cost going up a fair bit and the demo charges having gone. Though he does look really quite annoying and disruptive, potentially assassinating enemy characters, shooting back unexpectedly when you shoot him. And he's also got quite an annoying special rule that allows him to move, shoot, move, potentially either keeping hidden. And I think it looks like it would still trigger after he does a sort of return fire type attack, so he might be able to slip away and get out of lone operative shooting range. Looks kind of fun for 75 points, maybe just lost a little bit of the expendability and reliability that he had when he was 50 points and deep strikes though. Finally for the guard data sheets, we've got Sergeant Harker, 60 points now with your Kaschan man with payback. He can lead a squad of Kaschan jungle fighters and buff them at range a fair bit, giving you a plus one to hit enemy units that are greater than 12 inches away, so I guess usually shooting with two las gun shots at best. Definitely a bit less overwhelming that, seeing as the Kaschan troops can't take any special weapons besides flamers and can't take heavy weapons. He also does give a single order to Kaschan jungle fighters as well though, so if you are taking a unit of those, he could be a different alternative to Iron Hand Strachan. He is allowed to scout with them, so I guess you'd probably want either Harker or Strachan with them. Finally, he's got quite a fun way of basically just turning up the heat with payback once per game. Normally, it's just a regular heavy bolter that basically hits on threes even if he moves. Once per game, he can go up to six shots, and every hit roll of a six also becomes sustained hits three as well, rather than sustained hits one. In theory, with one round of shooting, that should average around about two or three dead space marines, though I guess that is quite an ideal target for him. Again, perhaps between the order, the shooting buff, and his own bonus heavy bolter might do enough to justify his cost. I can't help but think that Strachan maybe looks a bit more tempting for an advancing unit, though, with that very scary melee profile and big rerolls on the charge. So anyway, there we have it then, a bit of a look through Index Imperial Guard. Kind of cool to see all the fun new data sheets and the special rules they can bring to bear. Lots of really good stuff here. As I was saying at the start, I do really quite like that reinforcement stratagem, and I feel like the extra orders enhancement will be good. For the data sheets, probably going to want some big infantry units to try and take the midfield and then respawn when they die. And I feel like for damage dealers, some things between Rogal Dawn tanks, Lehman Rosses, and a decent amount of artillery seem like a pretty decent idea. I do quite like the multiple things that can allow you to focus fire with the guard, sentinels handing out reroll hit rolls of one, and the Lehman Ross exterminator giving you extra AP, in addition to things like orders. Transport units seem viable enough as well, with really quite cheap transports and zooming onto objectives and unleashing firepower after you do. And out of the characters, I feel like there's a lot that are really quite usable. The Psyker seems nice with his 4 plus invul. Either the Castellan or the Platoon Command Squad maybe, as a generic choice, adding feel no pain to infantry plus broadcasting orders. And for characters, I feel like Creed and Lord Solar together look absolutely excellent for just spamming command points. Free stratagems with Creed and free command points with Lord Solar. Hard to go too far wrong with all their orders as well. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts on the index in any case. Let me know which datasheet is standing out at you. What sort of things are you going to be putting on the board for your first games of 10th edition with them? In any case, I'm sure I'll be back for further Imperial Guard content in the future. Might be interesting to do a bit of a damage comparison with the Rosses at some stage. Feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics if you'd like to see that. And I'll certainly be aiming to make similar index reviews for the other launch factions as well. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.